Hey everybody, in this video we're going to be discussing about the most important uh, general themes that you need to understand in order to become a successful London System player. So, I've been coaching uh, dozens of players when it comes to the London System and I simply keep getting the same questions all over again, uh, both from my students and also from uh, my YouTube subscribers. So, uh, yeah. Probably the most uh, asked one is, all right, when are we supposed to play C4 or when should we stick with, well, let's say, the simple C3? That's kind of the most frequent uh, one that I get. We're going to be discussing uh, about that uh, in great uh, depth among uh, these theme. Another uh, super common one is, uh, let's say, how to deal with uh, positions after black plays the move bishop to D6 because most of the London system players are used to autopilot and simply play uh, the move bishop g3 while uh, a lot of the times I, uh, I recommend white to simply ignore that uh, tension and allow these uh, doubled uh, f pawn structures which I like to name the Berkish pawn structure. So uh, that will be another uh, topic of uh, our discussion. Also we're gonna go over uh, let's say the most efficient thinking process that uh, you want to have when it comes to thinking about the London system in general in these type of positions uh, after black plays um, uh, d4 and they go for d5. So we're not going to be talking that much uh, about uh, Fianchiaro setups because I simply have made a separate video about that dealing with uh, all the lines in, uh, in great depth there. So we're going to be going over this, let's say, uh, queen spawn uh, lines. And yeah, plenty of stuff uh, to discuss. Also, uh, we're going to go over these type of positions while white is going for uh, 95 because usually that is the most important plan into the uh, London system. So let's say we go for something like this. Um, black plays e3, bishop d6, we go like 9 bd2. And at some point we're going to play 95. They usually will take. And we're also discuss uh, in, let's say, uh, what cases should we aim for this uh, 95? When should we, let's say, meet bishop takes on e5 by taking with a pawn when it's actually good to uh, take it with a bishop because that's also more of like a situational case and we're going to be breaking down all of this uh, typical themes while trying to also explain uh, some of the let's say most common mistakes uh, that I see uh, people make while trying to uh, achieve these typical things. So uh, all right I think it's best to start with the most common question, when are we actually supposed to play with uh, with C4 in the London? And what I can give you is sort of uh, a set of rules, a set of uh, indicators that you can watch out for and uh, successfully be able to push C4 and get a good position. Now, by using these kind of general rules, you're going to usually have a uh, good position, like let's say a small advantage in general. But it doesn't necessarily mean that uh, c4 will always be the best move in the position because this way chess would have been simply a very easy game. So a lot of the times, uh, let's say when it comes to the first 10 to 15 moves, you actually need to know those from home. Like especially if you're aiming to, let's say, reach a rating that's above 1500 in, uh, uh, in online blitz on chess.com, let's say, normally it is super helpful that you know at least like the first 10 to 15 moves from home and you don't have these kind of questions when to play c4 when to do other things because these uh, kind of lines you just uh, have to know from home if you're like uh, planning to become uh, more of an ambitious chess player so uh, anyways you don't have to rely on the move by move stuff uh, that much applying these general themes that we're about to discuss is, uh, is enough, but if you're looking to uh, maximize your London system, it is very important to also get the uh, move by move stuff down. So, when do we play C4? That's why you clicked on this video, probably. Now, a very good indicator that uh, you can, let's say, guide yourself by is Whenever you see the enemy knight on c6, yeah, normally uh, you'll see that I like to start the London system with uh, the knight against uh, the move d5. And against everything else, I start with the second move, bishop to f4. And 
that is uh, having to do more with, uh, let's say, concrete lines that after bishop to f4 directly, black has some unpleasant uh, lines when they can go for a very quick c5. It's more of like a theoretical debate. I don't think it's that important to go uh, into great detail in this video about that since I think we've gone over it many times um, on the channel. You don't really need to uh, like understand these things. You just need to remember what's the right move. So well, we start with the knight uh, most of the times. And let's say black goes for knight c6, either on this move or let's say we get into this position. So normally this is a very common position that you will get in uh, lower rated games because let's be honest, people don't really know theory. At best, they have heard of this, uh, let's say like general rule that it's better to develop knights first and then the bishops because the knights are usually going onto their natural squares and then you have to decide what to do with the bishops, which is not a bad rule. But against the London system, it's actually not that great. And uh, yeah, I think Daniel Naroditsky is like pointing this uh, out quite a lot on his channel that the knight uh, in front of the c-pawn in the close games is a pretty misplaced piece because the problem with this is that black now is simply unable to strike in the center. So a lot of the times it's much better to play c5 first and then knight c6 so that black will have a little bit of pressure into the center and that will open up a lot more uh, possibilities for black to counterattack on the on the queen side. So uh, this is very common though for, for beginners, however. They play the knight to c6 all the time, and that is one of the biggest indicators that you can always go for the c4 break. So um, normally you could do something like e3 and then follow it up with uh, c4, knight c3, and that is going to be uh, a good uh, a good plan. Now, the thing with c4 and what makes it uh, super controversial is that... Uh, it's a pretty double-edged sword. So you can very much play uh, something like, let's say, black does the move bishop f5 now. You can always go for c3 in the London. And let's say you get a game. But it's not the greatest game. And a lot of the times, you're just going to be getting an equal position in these lines for a number of reasons. And before we dive more into like the specifics of... Uh, when should we go for c4 instead of c3? I want to talk a little bit about uh, the main thinking process in these kind of lines in the London system where white has the pawn on d4 and black has played um, the move d5. So I think it's best to just start off with uh, like a concrete example. Uh, I've got some uh, notes here that uh, I think it might be useful to use. So. Let's say we go back a little bit. Uh, black plays uh, the move e6. This is just the move order that I have here. And uh, let's say we go c6, e3. That's how the game that I have followed. Bishop back uh, to g3. Now you see that uh, white allow this uh, tension on uh, on f4 that we're going to discuss uh, about a bit later into the video. Now because the pawn was um, yeah under attack, like black's threatening to take on f4. Um, my student decided to step back, we see castle, and now we get, let's say, like a uh, typical uh, London system middle game. Because white has uh, developed the pawns, like every London system player would do, the pieces are very much on standard squares, and now it's time to uh, do something. So here, if you may, uh, you can pause the video and uh, think about this position for a while. You can let me know in the comments what move uh, would you go for? And uh, I think it would be interesting to compare it to uh, what I think is the best way to approach this position. So uh, generally, whenever we have a situation like this, the ideal move would be 95. First on my radar, I would try to make the move 95 work, which I think a lot of you may have suggested because you're a good player that's watching this channel, obviously. But the only issue with it is that uh, it's simply losing a pawn in this case. So 95 is not really a move. Black can simply take twice and uh, they will uh, emerge with an extra pawn. So that is not an option here. Now, 95 is always the most important plan that you want to constantly have in mind and uh, try to see whether it works or not. Uh, the second uh, plan is usually something that 
people don't even really consider in this uh, in this kind of games, which is the E4 move. And yes, I know a lot of the people would be prioritizing the C4 break way more often from my experience in these type of positions, and they would simply ignore that E4 is even a move, which is usually um, yeah, a very nice pawn break, um, threatening to just expand with E5, and um, then we're going to be having pressure on the king side. So uh, first it's knight e5, then it's e4. And if these two plans are not working, in general, that's when the c4 comes into play. So let's just say for the example's sake, uh, white made a waiting move, like let's say king h1, and now black plays uh, f5. And now we get into a pretty tricky position where a lot of people would feel uncomfortable because knight e5 is not a thing, same motive, it loses a pawn. And e4 is no longer a pawn break because black now is simply controlling that square. So we don't really have uh, that much to do as white, but to play uh, the move uh, c4. And uh, this may appear a little bit controversial because one of the most common mistakes when people try to go for the c4 break is that they first play c3 and then they lose a tempo on playing c4. But here it's not really that important because we're already in uh, in the middle game and white has finished development. There's like nothing more useful to do and the tempo that's lost, it's let's say not really that much felt and it's much more important than uh, that we get some play in this position because if you don't play c4, then you're going to get no moves. But after c4, all of a sudden, we're threatening to go c5. Let's say black does nothing, just goes king h8. We can try to expand, perhaps force them to take. And now we've got uh, this nice uh, pawn chain. That's clear indicator. We should be focusing into this green triangle. And therefore, uh, we can continue with a move like, let's say, again, they do nothing. We can continue with expanding on the on the queen side, uh, perhaps uh, take on a6, create a weak pawn, then we've got an outpost on b6 that we can perhaps try to uh, maneuver one out of our knights to, and uh, yeah, from a position where you basically had no moves, now white has a very easy game where, uh, yeah, we're pressing because we've got a better bishop against uh, a passive bishop. So, uh, yeah, I hope that makes it a bit more clear of uh, when it comes to which plan should you prioritize in this uh, d4, d5 uh, lines. Now, I, uh, I've mentioned that knight e5 is the most important plan that uh, you want to keep in mind. And when it comes to that, it's actually super important to understand when it's a good version to go for knight e5. Because knight e5 is going to be a lot of the times uh, playable but sometimes it actually won't be a good move. So as long as you understand the main thing about it, that's gonna separate you from a lot of the, uh, let's say, London system uh, beginners. So to give you an example, let's say black would play uh, something like uh, knight to c6, bishop to f4, and let's say they go uh, knight f6, we play e3. Again, very common position for the lower rated games. And now black plays the move uh, e sec, which is pretty common. They could also develop light squared bishop, but uh, we're going to see that uh, in the uh, following line. So after e6, let's say we go c3, bishop d6, knight e2. This is a very theoretical line. Um, this is super common again, like below 1700. I've had this position countless times in the London system rating line that uh, we did on the channel. And now black plays uh, the move queen e7. Now, something that you want to use in general whenever you're playing chess that's making you a much more successful player in general you want to always uh, be sure that you're asking yourself okay what is the point behind my opponent's last move that is crucially important because with their last move queen e7 black is now actually threatening to go for e5 and if you're simply you know pre-moving ignoring their thing and you castle let's say because it's very natural black goes e5 and then yeah, you'll have to trade everything most likely and you get a very dull position that's just around equal but definitely not fun to play, which is one of the main reasons uh, why a lot of people get discouraged and they uh, tend to quit the London because they're unable to pay attention to their opponent's threats and uh, they think the London is bad automatically because they don't know how to play it. So 
that's the hard truth. I had to I had to say it. Sorry. So uh, here after Queen e7, now uh, yeah, very common theme overall. We're gonna be playing knight e5 ourselves, just stopping black from pushing e5 and equalizing. So we're gonna go for this move, and now this is a good position, but. Of course, it's very important to understand why. Let's say black takes, because that's normally what it happens. Uh, otherwise, if they don't take, they make like a random move, let's say bishop d7, where has a very uh, powerful plan. And I think it could also be a very interesting exercise where uh, you can try to pause the video and uh, let me know what you would play, uh, because I think this is really by far one of the most uh, important plans that you need to understand on how to follow up the 95 move. Because a lot of people may get to this point, but most of them are actually uh, not getting the most value out of this because they tend to now like um, either castle or play other moves. So here, the best maneuver and the easiest overall is the move queen f3. And you'll see me playing this a lot in the rating climbs. The game usually go like a6, black tries something like b5, trying to create some counter play. We go g4, g5, try to get rid of this knight, and then because we have so much pressure against h7, we eventually end up mating them. So I had this in uh, countless games. This is just um, easily winning for white. But there is another interesting move in the position, which maybe you saw in the past, maybe you are thinking about it. Again, you can let me know in the comments, which is h4. That is actually setting up a, a very interesting opportunity that after... Uh, let's say bishop takes on e5, d takes on e5, knight e8, white well, has a very interesting possibility of the Greek gift, uh, with the main idea being that after king takes on h7, queen h5, king g8, we can bring the knight over, threatening to mate. And now the main idea with h4 is that if black is trying to play f6, taking away this g5 square, we're still gonna go g5 uh, anyways. I mean, knight g5, so... Main point, taking with a pawn, and now we've opened up this whole rook, and yeah, something that usually happens in my games, black players are just like panicking, taking rook takes on f4, I mean, there's a simple threat of going g6 and then taking away f7 square, followed by mate, so they tend to panic, and then there is simply a forced mate, after the move g6, only move for black, take the pawn, and that's a forced mate. So, if you are thinking of h4, that is a very interesting move, and uh, it clearly shows that uh, you have a pretty decent understanding of the London system, but the more tricky part to h4 is, um, from my experience and what I've noticed in my students' games as well, is that if black does not take on e5 and say they do something else, like let's say they do something random, yeah, rook b8 preparing to push. I mean, then it's not that easy and straightforward to follow this up. I mean, you can push your pawn like all the way to h6. Still, it's not going to be that straightforward to play. And therefore, I am not a big fan of this plan like, uh, like at all, especially for beginners. I think this is complicating things really unnecessarily when you have such an easy follow up like uh, we saw with mm, queen f3, uh, queen h3 and so on. So, uh However, in a lot of your games, opponents won't really have the patience to deal with, let's say, such a knight on e5, and they will just snipe it right away. With bishop takes pawn takes and go knight d7. Hitting e5, we just have to protect the pawn. And now it's time to evaluate this position a little bit, because we've got a pawn on e5 that is a little bit of a weak pawn, but it could also be an asset when it comes to our attack. Because what this pawn does, it's actually taking away the... Uh, f6 square, which is, um, yeah, well, usually, uh, let's say, whenever black has a knight on f6, their king is feeling pretty safe. It's usually very hard to checkmate black if they have the knight on that square. So, when uh, we see this um, trade happening after bishop takes e5 and then knight e7, all of a sudden the enemy king uh, is feeling uh, a bit shaky. But really, the main thing... And the main reason why this position is actually good for white, and that should be one of the main uh, takeaways from this video, is that white only has attack as long as we have control of this diagonal. So if you don't have that, then usually this is just a slightly worse position because you have a double pawn on e5 that is pretty weak and you have no compensation for it. So let me show you 
a way that uh, I see this happening all the time, especially in lower rated games. Uh, people would, uh, let's say, meet bishop to f5 with, let's say, uh, very common knight bd2, just, you know, moving their pieces uh, aimlessly, <laughs> c3, bishop d6, and now knight e5 seems to be pretty common move. And after bishop takes on e5, pawn takes knight e7, hitting e5, it goes knight f3, protecting e5, let's say black castles, then we go bishop e2. And if we compare this position to the previous one, here black is clearly better. And this is one of the main things that you really want to stay away from as a land system player because, as I was saying, really the name of the game in this structure is who's controlling the uh, b1 h7 diagonal. And here it's black, meaning we have uh, yeah no attack, therefore we've got no compensation for the weak pawn on e5 and black is simply better. This is very common. You really want to keep this in mind and uh, not play knight e5 if somehow black managed to uh, take away uh, control over that um, that diagonal. So, um, I hope that makes it a little bit more clear when it comes to, um, yeah, when should we go knight e5, what is a good version for us. Remember, as long as you have the uh, control over the b1 h7 diagonal, um, that is a pretty good indicator. You may very well just go for it. And now... Let's come back a little bit to your favorite question, which is, all right, we well, got it. Knight on c6, we play c4. Makes sense. But what else? Because if you analyze your London system games, you saw in various positions that computer is a huge fan of c4 and you may have not really understood why. And for good reasons, because it's actually a bit of an abstract topic and it's hard to like really make a clear cut rule. But I think I came up with, uh, I think, a set of decent rules that makes it quite, uh, quite easy to, to figure out. So, uh, okay, this has to do more with uh, pawn breaks in the London in general. So I think we can think of this rule both when we're thinking to play C4 or E4. Whenever you're thinking of delivering such pawn break, your D pawn uh, should be pretty safe, meaning that there's no like pawn on C5 putting pressure on D4. So typical mistake that I see um, when people try to go for C4, let's say black has went for um, yeah one of the C5 main lines with knight C6, the white players would just go for C4 here. I don't know why, but it's simply not great because uh, yeah, as I was saying earlier, there's pressure on d4. Now black has options to go for something like cd4, force an isolated pawn, get the bishop to g4, and then um, yeah, just get a very sort of comfortable position. They will just uh, finish castling, follow up with dc. We're going to have the isolated pawn. This is simply not a, not a great version. So therefore, now that we're here, one of the simple rules is that whenever black is playing with uh, these uh, d5, c5 main lines, we usually uh, play with c3 there uh, always. So just, you know, making sure that uh, d4 is nicely protected as a side note. Uh, now, more, uh, yeah, indicators of uh, when c4 is, uh, is a good move. Um, just to give you an example, we saw that when the knight is on c6, that's, um, yeah, the way to go. What you'll see very common for uh, lower rated games, they will play moves like this, or maybe h6, or something weird that you never saw in your life, and you're like, all right, how am I supposed to deal with this? Chess is too hard, we cannot prepare against everything, and I should stop studying openings because nobody plays Fury. Wrong. <laughs> you just need to actually uh, understand, like, let's say, your main plan, see the bigger picture first and once you understand the bigger picture your opponent's moves you realize are actually a bit forced maybe not that much in the long but in general that's the principle that applies and uh, i've got a pretty nice tip that uh, i think uh, you can try to use if you're using uh, chess base or simply if you have uh, an account on leeches and you're doing uh, let's say any kind of analysis there uh, when you have an engine on while doing analysis on leeches or in chess base, in order to understand what is uh, your main idea, you can usually hold the X key 
and that will usually show the thread. So now that I'm in chess base, if I press X, it shows me that, uh, okay, uh, the move uh, knight c3 is apparently best if black were to do nothing, just kind of weird transposition to the Jibava London, or also e3 is another very good move there. Um, you can do this little experiment with chess as well. Um, in chess base, it's just that the engine will show you uh, the move that you're supposed to play. In chess, I think it will actually draw an arrow to indicate uh, what your plan is. So that is something super useful that uh, I highly advise you to use whenever you're like looking at openings and you are not really sure what's the point behind uh, one move. Just press the X key and that will draw an arrow indicating the best move. So on chess.com, I don't think it works like that. I am not sure if there's actually a way to do this on chess.com. Uh, if uh, anybody uh, knows, you can just let me know in the comments. Maybe we can help uh, other people out. So, uh, yeah, just um, whenever they do any kind of weird moves on the side, that's a very good indicator that c4 is a great move. Yeah, let's say they do h6, you do c4. And the reason why we do c4 is that, well, we're having the white pieces, we're already having an extra tempo. So, when black is making a move like h6, basically putting us ahead to tempos, this is just a great opportunity to strike in the center, okay? I don't know what kind of analogy to come up with uh, here. Um, I don't know. Let's say you're in, in a boxing match. Yeah, now that chess boxing is becoming a thing. Uh, when somebody plays uh, h6, it's like he, he almost like is falling on the ground. He's like, you know, shaking. When he's shaking, you need to come up with another punch. That's usually when c4 happens. So uh, I hope that makes it a bit easier to understand. You'll see that a lot of the uh, the times, lower-rated players make these kind of weird moves um, yeah, every single time. So another rule that you can use and... This is not only with the knight to c6, but whenever you see a move like uh, f6, so pawn to f6, good indicator, just go c4, strike in the center. Now, whenever you play this c4 type of move, you will usually want to follow it up with knight c3 and then uh, put pressure in the center. One of the most uh, common mistakes that I've seen is people either play c4 and then they follow it up with like a passive knight bd2, or they would first play knight bd2 and then do c4, which is not going to be taking the most value out of it because you already know that whenever you play c4, you want to go for knight c3 afterwards. So um, when you commit with knight bd2, c4 is becoming uh, less appealing usually. Um, okay, so we saw f6, we saw the knight on c6, with pawn moves on the side, we play c4. One more thing... Uh, uh, about this d4, d5 lines. Uh, let's say whenever your opponent goes for like the copycat or a slav with the bishop on f5, so either like this or c6, e3, bishop f5, then you have a very interesting alternative to go for c4. One of the main reasons, once again, we can play c4. Notice there is no pawn on c5, so d4 is pretty safe. And with this move... Uh, we're actually preparing to play queen b3 and uh, highlight the fact that the b7 pawn has now been weakened due to the fact that the bishop has been developed quite early. Very common theme. So on e6, white can usually benefit by playing queen b3 and a very common move here is just queen b6. And now because we have uh, uh, played it the proper way, we can actually take advantage of the c4 pawn by advancing it one more step to c5, forcing queen b3 leading to a pleasant uh, and typical slav endgame for white, where we can just try to um, expand on the queen side, getting b5. If they stop that, usually we can maneuver the knight to a5. We've covered this endgame a bunch of times on the channel already. So, um, against the slav and the bishop onto f5, that is definitely something that um, I recommend. Against the copycat specifically, I think c4 in this position is quite interesting, which uh, will be an update in the future in my uh, London course. So far, we have uh, the e3, e6, bishop, d3 recommendation and taking with a pawn. But I think uh, c4 is quite interesting because, um, yeah, most of the black players will be unable to find the best move here, which is knight c6. That's uh, leading to equality after some uh, kind of complicated lines. Uh, the... 
main idea with uh, queen b3 here is, uh, however, that uh, black will simply play suboptimal continuations like uh, b6 or queen c8. Those are very common and could potentially give white um, a nice position. So, uh, okay, before we wrap up about this uh, c4 break uh, in the d4, d5 lines, um, I just want to quickly give you an idea of, uh, let's say, what could be the uh, main uh, sort of plan when uh, we actually get to push it. How do we want to follow it up? So, um, okay, let's just say black goes bishop to f5. Again, don't really pay attention to the move orders that much, as I was saying, like in this specific position, bishop to b5 is the best move objectively, but this is more of a like general idea uh, discussion. So let's just say we play c4, just so we can get into a standard position. Black plays bishop e7. Uh, well, let's say we go for bishop e2, both sides castle. Uh, let's say black plays uh, rook e8 kind of move, or maybe let's just say they make a luft, take on d5. We usually do that after c4, entering the so-called uh, Karlsbad structure. And uh, now we can get the rook onto the uh, semi-open file. The rook is always useful there. Let's say black plays rook e8, and now we will usually just keep expanding on the queen side with moves such as a3, b4, followed by knight uh, a4, knight to c5. And white has very um, easy play on the queen side whenever they want to take that knight um, with a bishop. Um, okay, let's just say we make some more uh, random waiting moves to show up uh, white's plan. One of the main ideas will be to follow it up like this and bring the queen to b3, who comes to c1, try to uh, kick the knight away with b5, and then the pawn on c7 will feel pretty weak. And um, just a side note, um, if you are looking for a weapon against e4 that you want to, um, let's say, look a bit alike uh, the London system, I think the Karo Khan is uh, definitely the best choice that uh, you can go for right now, um, both for beginners and also for, let's say, players that are uh, striving to become title players one day. I think Karo Khan, for instance, is leading to positions that could be very similar, like the Cosba structure that we've just seen, let's say. So just to give you a quick example, um, I know this may not really make a lot of sense at first, but um, okay, let me flip the board so you can actually see it from Black's perspective. It will become pretty clear in a second, uh, as long as I am uh, able to remember the line, but you already know that I have uh, learned uh, all theory of chess, so this shouldn't be a big deal. Okay, let's say they play bishop g5. Play bishop e7, they go h3, let's say we take, uh, let's say we throw in rook c8, rook e1, with castle, rook a d1, a6, bishop f1, b5. Now, if you compare these to what we have just seen a minute ago, black is going to go for the same plan, same pawn structure, easy play. I got a lot of easy wins like this in the Karokan rating climb that we have on the channel, so yeah, I don't know, just saying. If you're a London system enthusiast, you may really want to incorporate the Karokan in your repertoire. So, uh, okay, now that we mm, discussed about that, I want to give you just, uh, I think this is pretty much the last uh, pointer uh, on the list uh, about the C4 break against the Dutch. That's basically, uh, yeah, when we are always going to go for the, uh, the C4 break. So, just I'll show you one of the basic setups against the Dutch. We will normally develop our pieces like this. So, uh, yeah, look at the pawns. Then the pieces are usually going like that. Important that the light squared bishop, you really want to think of this, stays on e2 and not on d3 because one of black's main themes is to play uh, for e5. And if your bishop was on d3, it would have uh, gotten forked. So bishop is just better placed on e2. It's just a bit safer. And then... Uh, you really want to go for c4 against the Dutch. Any kind of that that Dutch that, that sorry. <laughs> Any kind of Dutch that they play, you really want to go for uh, c4. Yeah, whether it's Leningrad, whether it's like uh, Stonewall, whether it's like classical Dutch, the setup remains the same. Just go c4. Typical mistake. People just play c3 and they are much slower on the queen side. While you can play c4 right away, knight c3, and usually try to expand uh, with c5. It's true, black will get some play on the um, 
on the king side, let's say, by or maybe in the center with e5, but we just step back to h2, and usually white's play will be faster on the queen side. So, um, yeah, I think that should basically sum it up about uh, when to actually play uh, c4 in the in the London. Uh, I hope that makes it a bit more clear. And yeah, now, as I was saying, usually we aim for uh, c3 against the c5 main line. So uh, if something like this happens, we're like far more likely to continue with, uh, with c3. So against the c5 main line, it's always c3. And um, one thing that... Um, yeah, I think it's worth mentioning. Let's say they play like a Chigorin again and they do go for e6. You'll see me a lot of the time not going for c4 here during the rating climb. But even though c4 is a reasonable move, as I was saying, you can play it and you're going to get a slightly better position. Whenever the light squared bishop is boxed in like that, restricted by the pawn, I just like to stick with a, with a simple London and just play c3. Prepare bishop d3 without allowing uh, knight b4. And I usually tend to aim for uh, these positions and uh, just going for bishop to d3. And because of the enemy bishop being so passive, this is usually just very easy to play. And we just get to attack their king. So, uh, now that we uh, went over these themes, I think uh, one uh, yeah important thing that uh, remains to be mentioned. And uh, I left it, I think, for the... Uh, end of the video is because of the fact that, uh, well, I think this is maybe even more common that, uh, yeah, than the c4 break, which is, okay, we play bishop f4, let's say they go for e6, and now black goes bishop to d6. How on earth is not so good to, like, go bishop to g3, I mean... You may be wondering, okay, but if black gets to take, we just get such a nice file for the rook and we can mate black and beginners play this a lot, they fall into it. So, regarding that, it's true that, um, you know, beginners all the time may release tension, that's a very common mistake, they take on g3 because, you know, they just, they see something, they take it, basically. You know, it's, it's pretty easy to predict them sometimes, but... Um, you know, because you're following this channel already, you will improve a chess and you will start facing stronger and stronger opposition. At some point, they will not really take on G3, like, at all. And what will happen a lot of the times, let's say, from a theoretical perspective, let's say they castle, you're gonna do your, let's say, uh, normal London setup, but now black has an additional line to go for a tricky queen C7. And because you have um, went for this early bishop D3, committing to that, you will be most likely a victim to this uh, quick e5 break and you're going to be entering these positions that really make a lot of the white players quit the London system because they are just so dull and hard to get any play. So, therefore, uh, the simple rule that uh, you can use whenever uh, yeah, black plays bishop to d6, as long as they play bishop d6 without having committed to c5, Allowing them to take is fine. And the reason for that is because, let's say, if black goes for a version like this, when they go bishop d6 with a pawn on c5, now, just ignoring it won't be so great because because of the move c5, black can actually take on f4, double up the pawns, and follow it up with queen b6, hitting both the b2 and the d4 pawn, and we're going to be losing a pawn. So, when is c5... We simply uh, answer bishop d6 by stepping back, and then we continue with uh, normal theory. That, again, we have gone over on the channel before, and we're not going to really spend much time going uh, into right now. But, uh, yeah, remember that rule. Now, just a quick guide after bishop d6, knight bd2, and uh, what happens when they take. There is uh, basically one simple rule that uh, you want to have. In, uh, in these positions, as long as bishops are on the board, white is better. And uh, yeah, a lot of the games will um, go something like c5, let's say, or maybe even queen d6. Uh, well, when they play queen d6, we can safely cover that pawn with, uh, with g3. Uh, just kingside is very safe and structure is very solid. You don't have to worry about weakening your king or anything like that. Um, if black plays c5, we usually like to take and... 
develop our bishop to d3 and we're gonna be getting in these kind of positions where we have pretty simple development uh, when they do knight c6 we want to play c3 making sure to stop knight b4 and the queen goes to e2 rooks are coming onto the central files so let's say uh, game could continue something like this and then we usually will bring the knight to b3 d4 bishop steps back to b1 this knight will activate via e5 and then we can usually just uh, keep expanding in the uh, I mean, a little bit in the center, but uh, more so on the king side with ideas to push the h-pawn. Maybe we can go g4, g5. We can set up the battery uh, with queen to d3. And black does not really have to do that much in the meantime. Pretty simple. The factor that dictates this position is that our bishop is very active, while the enemy bishop is uh, very passive. So simply because of that, white, gain, white, white gains an advantage. This is why I love the London. This is why it's so simple and uh, so effective so that should be like a very brief introduction to how to play this structure when to allow it remember once again that uh, whenever they play bishop to d6 without c5 we can let them take and uh, one last thing if let's say they try to do the same variation yeah that i was mentioning what if they go for queen c7 now you may be wondering followed by knight d7 and e5 how is this move order stopping it well now the difference is that we have not uh, wasted a tempo in playing bishop g3 and we have got the bishop developed to d3. And I get this position a lot of the times. We have so many videos on the channel of me beating grandmasters in it because white's play is simply very easy and even a moron like me can win a grandmaster. Okay, it's not that I'm the greatest player of all time or anything like that. It's just because of the fact that the game plays itself. So... I usually just take on d6, plonk the knight onto e5. If they go knight e6, I just like to support it with f4. And then white has very easy play. We just castle, we go for the rook lift, and we get, um, um, yeah, very deadly attack against the enemy king. Uh, I think one fun line that uh, it's worth mentioning here after rook h3, let's say cd4 is like one of the most common mistakes. And then white has a little Greek gift with bishop h7 and then queen h5, and the mate is unstoppable. So that's uh, one way you can get a quick win um, with this structure and why um, yeah, this um, sort of tricky queen c7 line does not really impact our move order at all. So, uh, yeah, with that being said, uh, I think we have uh, managed to go over all the um, major things that I had to explain about this. Uh, let's say middle game ideas. Uh, yeah, we went over the c4 plan, uh, went to go for knight e5, went to go for c3, mm, went to step back with the bishop on g3, and went to allow uh, the double pawn structure. So, um, yeah, I think that was uh, basically what I had uh, in mind to uh, cover in this lesson. If you are interested to see how to play the positions arising after the um, kingside fianchero uh, yeah make sure to check out the other video that i made i just made a full guide about the um, jubava london against it how to just crush the king's indian pretty easily uh with the london and uh yeah thank you guys for making it uh this far into the video if you are enjoying the content make sure to drop a like because it really helps the algorithm push the video to more people and one last bonus tip for the owners of my London System course. Okay, this is just a pro tip because you have made it this far into the video. Now, if you're looking to actually master these kind of lines and uh, try to learn them, the easiest way to do it won't be to actually start with, uh, you know, the first chapters. would actually be to start the other way around a little bit by going uh, down to this uh, typical tactics chapter that we have. There you will be able to find uh, 50 thematic puzzles all coming from the London system and the main goal would be for you to go through them as many times as you need until you're like, let's say, uh, we open this up, we try to solve one of these uh, positions and whenever you see it, you're able to just find it in a bling because you get that pattern recognition going. 
So for instance, here would be bishop takes on f6 and uh, queen b3. I obviously don't need time to find these things because I just went through them so many times. So that's uh, your main goal if you want to actually be successful with a course. And then once you do that, it will be much easier to grasp all the other concepts because you know how to win the games and therefore it will be much easier for you to kind of think in advance and try to set up the winning positions. So thanks again for giving me your time and I'll see you around on the channel. Take care.